So welcome, welcome, welcome. I hope you all have your beverage sip of choice. You need that in a minute. So good afternoon. Welcome to Scholar Sip. Um, just as an aside, about a few quarters ago, there was a group of social scientists. I don't know if any of you were there, and um, asked me, "What can we do to help build community?" And two different table groups, not knowing I was there, so I wasn't to impress me, said. Well, there's something on campus called scholars. <laughs> and one of them said, not sure what it is, but by the title I suspect, they must drink. <laughs> so we have a certain branding, but that's not for those of you who have been with us. Anyway, I'm Janine Nitesky, Dean of Libraries, and I'm pleased to welcome you to those of you who have been with us from the start of 20, the third, 23rd of these events. So we're pretty proud of that. So this is a series that was launched in 2011 as part of the library's strategic goal to connect members of the campus community to scholarship. Uh, even when I say scholarship, I often to say scholarship. Anyway, it is a social setting, as you have now experienced, with food for thought, uh, discussions about cross-disciplinary research, and a toast to the end of the academic term. So we're once again recording and streaming this event live online for a couple of our colleagues on campus, and so I want to extend a really warm welcome to them. I don't know if we've connected them yet or not, but uh, I, yes, we do. Good. So, welcome for joining us virtually. And go ahead and make sure you have some of this. <laughs> the theme of this year's scholarship, <laughs> scholarship <laughs> is communicating research to inspire citizen engagement. So during each quarterly event, a distinguished Drexel faculty professor will offer food for thought on the importance of communicating research to engage and empower members of diverse communities beyond academia. Speakers will explore the implications of their work and how they distill the results of their research into comprehensible formats that are re relevant to the general public. So in December, those of you who join us then, Professor Laura Gitlin, Dean of Drexel's College of Nursing and Health Professions, set the stage for this year's theme with a food for thought discussion about her work to address the complex health and wellness needs of older adults and their families, as well as the challenges she faces to bring knowledge and understanding of her research to the general public. And in June, we will have Professor Ted Dashler from the Academy of Natural Sciences at Drexel University, as well as the uh, College of uh, COAS, uh, Arts and Science. And he'll close the year's ser uh, series. So mark your calendar for June 10th. This is always the last day of class of the three academic terms. But this term, I'm very pleased to welcome our guest speaker, the distinguished professor, Amy Scheller. So Dr. Scheller is a professor of sociology and the founding director of the Center for Mobilities Research and Policy at Drexel University. She served as the president of the International Association for the History of Transport, Traffic, and Mobility from 2014 to 2017. And she's the co-editor of the journal Mobilities, which she co-founded in 2006. She's also an author of 12 books, including her most recent 2018 publication, Mobility Justice, The Politics of Movement in an Age of Extremes, which we recognized during our Celebrating Drexel Authors event last month, which unfortunately she was off giving a talk or doing something else great and couldn't actually attend in person. So we're partly doing this again to congratulate you on that publication. Thank you. So Mimi is currently working on her next book, Island Futures, Caribbean Survival in the Anthropocene, I got that right, about post-disaster recovery and climate adaptation, with a focus on Haiti. She's also in the process of co-producing Fly Me to the Moon, a documentary film on bauxite. I don't know what that means. Bauxite. Bauxite. The mining. ore that aluminum yes, is made from. Yes. Oh. Mining and aluminum with director Esther Figueroa. Mm -hmm. Uh, made possible by a grant from the Graham Foundation for Advanced Research in the Fine Arts. So thank you very much for joining us today, Marie. Thank you. So I, I also, before we turn the mics over to her, I want to acknowledge the hard work that goes into planning these, this event each term. First, uh, I think he's out there. I want to extend our appreciation to Paul O'Neill, who you met behind the bar, from the Drexel Center for Food and Hospitality Management, and the students who are enrolled in the Drexel Culinary and Hospitality Department program. Um, and they, their courses prepare these things, and they serve really the amazing food. And a number of the pâtés and 
um, things for their concoctions. Firstly, today they have a class at, at six, so we're really going to have to be insured by then. Um, a wine pairing class. Oh, <laughs> for it. So I also Same. want to particularly <laughs> yes, <laughs> we audited. Audited, right. I also want to thank uh, Stacy Stanislaw, our library's communication manager, for her work in organizing all these events. So now, before I turn the podium over. Let us continue our scholar sip tradition. Mine's over here. Oh, <laughs> that's mine. <laughs> and raise a toast to the uh, winter term 2019. And for those of you who have to grade, have this in mind. Be kind to your students. And just give them all good grades. And here's your next year. Cheers. <laughs> Mimi, thank you for doing this. Thank you, Danuta. I think I will use the mic. Now that I hear your voice, it projects well with the mic. Um, so thank you so much for the invitation to join you. Um, and thank you for all of you for coming out on a Monday evening. I didn't expect such a big audience and live streamers out there. Thank you. Um, so I took quite seriously um, the sort of commission to talk about how my work reaches out beyond uh, the normal academic kind of field that I work in and to look at how it engages with other audiences. And in a way, that's the really fun side of doing the work I do, which is I'm a sociologist, um, but I'm also going to be talking about this field called mobilities research that I've been involved in co-founding. And mobilities research as a field is a kind of transdisciplinary and mobile field. That is, it moves around, and it moves me to different audiences and different kinds of engagements. And with spring coming and uh, the end of the term, I thought, let's, let's do the fun stuff. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what mobilities research is. But then I want to get right to two things. One is going to be about the sort of civic engagement side of my work. And then the other is about the creative arts and the way in which, as a scholar, I've tried to connect my work with artists and designers. So. Let's see. OK, so first, the overview of this field, uh, which is kind of known as the new mobilities paradigm. And uh, I, I got involved in this field when I was working at Lancaster University in England. And I co-founded the Center for Mobilities Research at Lancaster University with John Uri. And that was back in about 2003, 2004. And at that time, one of the sort of topics driving our interest was the, um, the question of sustainable mobilities. And we were already thinking about climate change and the transition beyond auto mobility, that is, car dependent cultures. And the, one of the ideas um, of the new mobilities paradigm was to partly think about a sociology of movement, of mobility and of why societies had been organized around automobility and how that shift might happen to something beyond that. At the same time, though, I was also doing work in the field of Caribbean studies. And the Caribbean is a very um, historically mobile place, right, of movements of people and, of course, uh, the triangular trade, the slave trade, the plantation commodity system and all the negative impacts of that movement, um, as well as the more positive connections of creolization and diaspora and traveling musical cultures and languages and uh, migration. So I had a, a sort of very long-term view of mobility as not just being about like what, how we get around right now in cities, but how did the world form from these complex mobilities that are sometimes about freedom of movement, but sometimes they're about inequality and coerced movements and who has the power to stay in a place, to dwell in a place, and how are those choices informed by power relations. So that was the kind of view we were bringing into this field of mobilities research. And uh, when I came here to Drexel, I um, founded the Center for Mobilities Research and Policy. And that was uh, almost 10 years ago. It's hard to believe. But uh, 2020, I guess, will be the 10th anniversary. It was founded in 2010. So I'm hoping to set up some kind of 10th anniversary celebration next year. And um, in, that, in that time, between sort of 2004 and 2010, um, I 
published a series of articles on the sort of defining the field and talking about the new mobilities paradigm, this field of mobilities research. And we started connecting with other people who were working on that, holding conferences and other centers and institutions started to form. And we built a kind of network of scholarship. So the Center for Mobility and Urban Studies at Alborg University, for example, I have colleagues there, I've been a visiting professor there, and I am engaged in a research project with some of them now on airports and um, air mobilities. And then um, just to give one other example, the field has stretched from having started kind of in social sciences to now being very engaged with humanities. And this group, the Academy of Mobility Humanities, uh, was formed recently at Konkuk University in South Korea. And they've just in, invited me to come and visit there because they're translating my book into Korean. So <laughs> Mobility Justice will be launched in Korean next December. Um, so these are just a few of the other um, places that I've, you know, have contacts and work with, just to give a sense. And this was our conference of, of this organization uh, that we call T2M on the history of transport, traffic, and mobility, which I was president of from 2014 to 2017. This was one of our conferences held in Mexico City in 2017. Um, we also held a conference here at Drexel in 2015, I believe, yeah. So um, it's been an exciting ride in a way on this field over the past 10 years and kind of developing it. These are just examples of some of the kinds of publications in the field if you're not familiar with it. So this is the journal I co-edit and founded called Mobilities. I'm also associate editor of this journal, Transfers. Um, this is uh, the Routledge Handbook of Mobilities, which is a kind of introduction and overview of the field. and. This is a new journal, uh, newer, called Applied Mobilities, um, which kind of looks at intersections of the more theoretical work in the field with applied work. And I'm on their editorial board. Um, and you know, we cover all sorts of topics from sort of transportation to cargo mobilities to living mobile lives to air mobilities. Um, this was my previous book, Aluminum Dreams, um, which is about the mobility of materials and metals as well as infrastructures and systems. Um, so, uh, along with the sort of formal centers and institutions, we've also formed these loose uh, research networks, I would call them. So, there's the, um, a group called the Cosmobilities Network, which is a sort of global group of mobility scholars, but there have been networks formed within each world region. So, there's a Mediterranean Mobilities Network, a um, Pan-American Mobilities Network, uniting sort of Latin American North, and North American scholars. There's a new Australian Mobilities Network. There's a New Zealand um, group. And uh, we all sort of hold various conferences and meet together. This was our, um, our launch event that when we launched here at Drexel. That was from 2010, Does Mobility Have a Future? Um, and we also um, held this conference, Mobilities in Motion, in 2011. Um, which at which we had the speaker, uh, Rhina Cutler, who at that time was the deputy mayor for transportation and utilities in Philadelphia. And I'm gonna talk in a moment about how my work connects to Philadelphia and transport planning in Philadelphia. Um, so this is my latest book, um, which came out in September. I'm gonna pass around a copy. It's called Mobility Justice, uh, et cetera, as Danuta was saying. It's published by Verso. And it's the first time I've published a book that's not with a university or academic press. And partly I wanted this book to have a wider public impact. So Verso is um, known as um, a, a, a left-wing publishing house based in London, but they, uh, it's been a very different experience than publishing with an academic press. They uh, send copies of the book out all over the place. They organize ev events. They've asked me to come and do book launches. Um, and I'm gonna talk later about one event that they've invited me to um, in May. Um, and just to read a little from the book blurb, it's, it says, mobility justice is one of the crucial political and ethical issues of our day. We are in the midst of a global climate crisis and experiencing the extreme challenges of urbanization. Um, in the book, I show how power and inequality inform the governance and control of movement. I connect the body, the street, the city, the nation, and the planet in one overarching theory of the modern, perpetually shifting world. 
et cetera. That gives kind of a sense of trying to look at across different scales of mobility and power and how they're connected from um, like how we move differently depending on our embodiment in terms of gender, race, sexuality, class, disability, uh, right up to looking at cities and urban planning and infrastructures and the movement of energy and resources. So that's an overview of the field. But what I want to get to is the fun stuff, because I didn't want to give you a research talk. So how does this work engage with different audiences? So civic engagement, um, for me, has partly been about working towards mobility justice. That is, how do we make the world more fair and equal and just in terms of who and what can move and how? Um, as I was working on the book, I became aware of this group called The Untokening, who you can find at theuntokening.org. And they are a movement of black, indigenous, and people of color who are working to transform the way that transport and urban planning get done and to make it more inclusive of their needs, their voices, their communities, their interests. Um, so they've been holding these events um, called Untokening California, Untokening Detroit. And, you know, they'll have another one coming up. I'm hoping someday to bring them here to have an Untokening Philadelphia. By Untokening, they refer to the fact that they are, as people working in issues to do with transport and cities, they were often being invited as the token person of color in the room. And they were not satisfied with that positioning and what it feels like to be in a white space where they're asked to like represent all people of color or something and sort of put their voice in to sort of rubber stamp what's being done. And they um, argue that instead we, we need to be the ones, you know, at the table, designing the process, talking through what we think our needs are and what needs to happen in terms of transport and planning. And I think it's really important, especially when things like the Green New Deal are being discussed right now and like big ideas about infrastructure investment and changing our transportation system is who's planning it like and who's it going to be for and how are the decisions being made. Uh, so this is a group who are working on mobility justice issues. And in fact, they formed a group called People for Mobility Justice. And so I like got in touch with them. I was like, hi, I'm writing a book called Mobility Justice. Can I talk to you guys? And so I've been trying to connect with them. And I've done um, like a webinar. And I've spoken to people, um, including um, Adonia Lugo, who is also an anthropologist and writer, as well as being a convener of the group, and someone named Naomi Derner. So um, Adonia has a, a book called um, uh, Bike Slash Race, Bike Race, that's about um, bicycle culture and thinking about issues of race and inclusion in biking. Um, and so they're doing a lot of really interesting and exciting work. And that's one of the ways I feel like the work I'm doing, which is quite academic and theoretical, can actually connect to these um, movements that are trying to organize in cities around the country. So um, actually this Thursday, I'm going to be speaking at this event at the um, AIA New York, which is uh, the Architects Professional Association, and it's at the Center for Architecture. It's called Mobility and Social Agency, Embedding Equity in Mobile Systems. And so Naomi, who I mentioned, is one of the conveners of the Untokening group, and she'll be there, and others who are kind of working in this more uh, activist and also um, applied work and talking about um, to like architects and designers are very interested right now in how they can be part of designing and planning more equitably. So um, it should be a really good conversation and um, bringing, again, diverse audiences to these issues. Uh, and this is just an example of the kind of arguments that are made by the untokening. They say mobility justice centers people over profit, property, or placemaking, and it prioritizes the community's lived experiences and aspirations as the
Equitable mobility projects take place in landscapes where profit sharing models are plentiful. So profit sharing, who shares in the benefits um, and profits from the changes happening. So the other place my work has taken me is towards um, working with the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission, not in any formal sense, but as a, a member amongst many other members of something called the Futures Working Group. And the Futures Working Group is the one that does these 10-year um, plans for Philadelphia, or five-year plans. So we're working on the 2050 plan right now. There's a 2045 plan that was worked on earlier. And so the, the DVRPC, as they're called, are bringing together a wide range of all different kinds of thinkers and doers and planners and theorists and activists to kind of talk about what are the future forces and trends that are going to affect Philadelphia in 2050 and how can we be prepared for them? And so we're kind of trying to work out ways to identify those and um, doing brainstorming sessions and voting and developing um, these different ways that all these different people have had input into. And to me, it's really interesting just seeing how the whole process works. How do you bring together 50 or 60 or 70 people with all different ideas and sort of get them into a, a planning process. Um, and I have colleagues in Europe who also do that kind of work and I've sometimes collaborated with them on projects in um, Denmark or Germany. Um, so the other group I work with is the Bicycle Coalition of Greater Philadelphia and they um, are the organization that's really been pushing for um, multimodal transportation, supporting biking and walking um, and bike sharing and what's called complete streets, streets that are designed for people who are not in cars. Um, and also what they call Vision Zero. Um, there was just a big Vision Zero conference this Saturday and there's been a lot of moves happening in the city council and the mayor's office to try to make our streets safer for all users. Um, and Vision Zero is a strategy to eliminate all traffic fatalities and severe injuries while increasing safe, healthy, and equitable mo mobility for all. So one thing I always keep in mind is when there's been some criticism of Vision Zero implementation in other cities where uh, sometimes um, immigrant and ethnic minority bike messengers, for example, have felt like they've been targeted by police and hassled. Um, for the use of, say, e-bikes, electric bikes, or biking unsafely, or not having certain equipment or whatever. So there's certain tension over the idea of making streets safer and safer for who, and who sort of pays the price as we make streets safer. So I'm hoping to, Philadelphia is going to do it the right way, the better way. Um, Philadelphia is known for having tried to make its bike share system more equitable and accessible than some other cities. Um, because of the, the way the bikes are distributed and the payment system. So we have to sort of keep working at that and building our reputation on that. Um, and then I also wanted to mention how my students get involved in this kind of work. So this year, I, this past term, I've been teaching um, a graduate course called the Connected Mobilities Lab. And the students were kind of asked to work on projects to do with new communication technology and changes in mobility in Philadelphia. And so the projects they came together uh, around included um, one that was looking at Amazon's last mile delivery operations in Philadelphia, one looking at electric scooter regulations in Philadelphia and the potential arrival of shared electric scooters on our streets, which may be coming soon. Um, there was a case study of mobility inequality in Philadelphia a uh, project on health and mobilities, and one called uh, Transit on a Human Scale, an Interactive Game. And I just want to show you this project. So this was um, students who designed a board game. It's like an urban planning board game. There's a map of Philadelphia, and you get pieces, um, and you each player is places their piece in a different neighborhood, and they have different um, degrees of sort of power. Um, and then you have to build uh, the infrastructure for transport and you can build a bike lane or build a bus or subway line start to build it. it takes time to build a bus or subway line or you can get automated vehicles and they kind of connect the neighborhoods in different ways and then your player has to get to work and 
And basically what happens is as neighborhoods develop, um, the, the housing price goes up. And some people get priced out of their neighborhood and they have to leave the city. And it's a really fun game and it worked really well. The students did a great job on it. Um, and it's another like fantastic way to engage diverse audiences and talk about these issues of gentrification and accessibility and neighborhood change and have people actually play the game to, to learn about that. Okay, so now I'm gonna move on to the creative um, arts projects and how they link to mobility's research. Um, and again, it's about bridging diverse audiences. So the first project I'll mention, I'm gonna pass a few of these around. This was um, an art exhibition that I co-curated with a colleague named Hannah Iverson. Um, it was called LA Replay. And we were interested in how mobile media and uh, was being used in art. So how like mobile phones and locative media, augmented reality, were kind of being used by artists in various ways. And so this, uh, we went to the College Art Association Conference in Los Angeles that year, and we held two panel sessions with artists presenting their work, and then we curated a show that was at three different locations in Los Angeles, um, including at UCLA and uh, the Art Center in Pasadena, and then another one that was augmented reality, which was you could access in all different places. And they were great artists and it was really fun and really interesting and I realized how much I liked kind of working with art around these concepts of mobilities. So we then, um, we developed two classes together that we actually taught here at Drexel. They were interdisciplinary classes, so they had students um, from Westfall and from civic engagement and um, different sort of undergraduates. Uh, one was called Neighborhood Narratives, that was this one. And at that time, this one was, I think, 2011, and this one is 2012 or, or 2013. Um, so Neighborhood Narratives was uh, uh, connected to an art show along Lancaster. neighborhood organizations and our class was one small link in this wider art show. And we had the students um, introduced to community organizers um, like um, uh, George Stevens who was involved in sort of uh, organizing along Lancaster Avenue and PEC, the People's Emergency Center. And they introduced us to elders in the community who had stories to tell. And the students collected their narratives, their stories, and then they turn them into a augmented reality walking tour and then did a show at um, a, a sort of unused building where the neighborhood uh, members whose stories were being told could come and learn about the technology of augmented reality. So we had like iPads and stuff and people could look at their story and then the stories were also placed along Lancaster Avenue with these QR codes where you could access, this would, you would basically hold your phone up to this and up would pop like a pop-up book and past images of the person and the neighborhood um, story they wanted to tell and then an audio recording of their story. Um, we then moved on to this other class called Urban Vitality in the Arts, where we invited um, a series of artists from the Center for Creative Research to kind of come and talk to the class about and, and work with the class on how creative processes contribute to a thriving city. Um, and we also held a sort of neighborhood roundtable where the people who had been involved in the neighborhood narratives course were invited to the roundtable with the artists to talk about urban vitality and the role of the arts in it. So those were really fun, exciting courses and it was nice to sort of have artists in the classroom doing um, projects with the students and with the community. Um, this is, uh, this is an image of, this is George Stevens here and Hannah Iverson out on Lancaster Avenue, if you recognize the um, MLK uh, mural there, and a student who designed this kind of poster and story, kind of testing it out. Okay, so that was like the beginning of my interest, and then it's led to a series of other art exhibitions and conferences with art exhibitions, and eventually to this um, organization of um, art and mobilities, a, a network, an art and mobilities network 
So we held a conference in 2017 called Mobile Utopia, and it was back at Lancaster University where the Center for Mobility's Research had been founded. And they helped organize this um, great event with a curatorial team um, and a whole series of artworks that were presented alongside the conference. And this, uh, out of that, we published this kind of instant journal where it has um, 20 or 25 different people who kind of tell the story of the role of art in their work and the link between art and mobilities. Um, so I just wanted to show that as another development in the field. And the things like the, the exhibition that the flyer's going around, LA Replay, it also led me to um, co-edit with Hannah Iverson a, an issue of Leonardo Electronic Almanac, which is an important kind of media arts journal. And so all of our artists were in an issue of that journal. And then this group um, have been publishing kind of work in, in the journal mobilities. We're publishing on the Mobile Utopia Conference. And um, I'm, the, I'm not an author in that, but I'm a kind of reviewer and editor of that. And then we're working on another special issue of the journal Applied Mobilities, where we sort of try to talk about how these art projects and artist initiatives work. And so some of the things that the artists here were doing were called mobile experiments. And we kind of took art out into the community and had people experiment with thinking about different forms of mobility and movement. So one example uh, was called Dronetopia. And it was about um, delivery of different things by drone. And the example we used was um, blood for blood transfusions. And in an emergency, could drones be used to deliver blood? And to have that conversation, the, um, the mobile experiment group, what they made was basically, they were paper airplanes, but we would attach something that was meant to picture blood, and then you had to sort of try to get it to a hospital. And you would sort of toss your paper airplane to the hospital and see what, you know, if your blood made it there or not. But it, it was a way to engage with the public and talk about drone deliveries of blood and then how that's actually a real thing that's, you know, is being done in certain places and how do remote communities get um, uh, drugs delivered by motorcycle and how do you power refrigerated um, kind of medicines and things like that using solar power in remote places. So that, that was just one sort of example. Um, so more recently and still currently running, um, there's an exhibition right now at the Pearlstein Gallery called The Speed of Thinking and it's by the artists jo Joel Dietrich and Owen Mundy. And I got to know them through a project they did called Cargo Mobilities. And if you remember, I showed you a book called Cargo Mobilities earlier. And they are um, a North Carolina-based artist team and they're interested in mobilities. And so I kind of invited them to try to sort of come here and, and offer this show to the Pearlstein Gallery who kindly were interested and accepted it. And it has projections of their work, which are about the mo movement of freight and cargo, but also of information. And they have a, one project called Packet Switching, which is about how information gets broken up into packets and moved. And their game, The Speed of Thinking, involves um, a cargo ship, and you as a, you're a player, and you have to catch um, containers, freight containers on the cargo ship. And so you sort of catch them, and they pile up and pile up. But each one you miss falls in the ocean, and the ocean starts to rise, and it starts to flood your city. So it's another way to have, use a game to have a discussion, a conversation about consumption, the movement of freight, the link to climate change, and do it in a kind of fun way. So it was a nice contrast between their game, which you can get on an iPad, and my students' game, which we presented at the gallery, which was a board game. Um, and I wanted to just point out some other current exhibitions that are running. Um, this one ends again 24th of March. So this is an exhibition in Copenhagen by the Koss Museum of Art in Public Spaces. And they say here, we travel as never before, but on radically different terms with the exhibition project Transit the Coast Museum of Art and Public Spaces investigates transit sites currently among the most controversial and crowded public spaces of contemporary society and the many different kinds of travelers using them. 
So they placed the art at train stations and on the E um, metro line, and they have public debates and a special edition of the newspaper information. And they invited me to write basically an essay for the catalog of this um, exhibition and to think about transit spaces as spaces of encounter between different kinds of people and how the art could sort of activate the space and in bring people new ways of thinking about not just passing through transit space, but who is there, how do they engage with each other, how does diversity happen in transit spaces. Um, and they had some uh, interesting artworks, which I can, if we have time, I can show a few of the other images on the website. And then the other show that's currently running, which I'm very excited about, is this one called Mobile Immobile. Um, and I'll pass around the catalog. I'm just going to ask you not to bend this all the way back, because it's one of those books that will crack if you like open it all the way. You can peek in it. Um, so this is currently running at the National Archives in Paris. And it's organized by a group called the Forum V Mobile, or the Mobile Lives Forum. And I've been on their International Scientific Advisory Board for um, uh, seven or eight years. And they had been doing this project called um, the Artistic Lab, where they brought together social scientists and artists to kind of have a conversation and comment on each other's work. And so they um, had invited me to comment on the work of the artist Ai Weiwei, who you may have heard of. And while Ai Weiwei was working on his big, huge global project on refugees um, and the mo mobilities and movements of refugees, part of his project was photographing people who were using cell phones while they were crossing the Mediterranean and or at the camps in Greece um, as they tried to enter the European Union from Syria and from North Africa. And so I had a conversation with Ai Weiwei about mobile phones and refugees, and we recorded an interview at his studio in Berlin. And some of that work is shown now in this show. And so I wrote um, a, a wall panel and a brief piece in the catalog and um, a video recording that's part of this. So this, um, this one is described as reflecting on how mobility is central to our contemporary lifestyles and what it may become by bringing together the views of contemporary artists and social science researchers, along with the collections from the National Archives, the Mobile Immobile exhibition sheds light on a certain ambivalence with regards to travel. Indeed, travel can be a great source of freedom, the thrill of speed, the possibility to move away from one's geographical environment or to work in the city while living in the countryside, but also of alienation, intensification of daily life, pressures of professional mobility, um, of controls and restrictions, the migrant crisis, the varying degrees of access to transport, and environmental issues such as pollution and climate change. So this show kind of tries to bring together the good and the bad the, um, and the ugly of mobility and immobility and how they um, interact. And it's been, I think, a really important conversation in France right now concerning both the migration cr crisis, or what I call the refugee reception crisis, and the yellow vest movement, which has been a sort of counter movement right, against the effort to um, raise fuel prices uh, in, in a sort of carbon tax. So there's really interesting political conflicts happening now. And it's important to have public conversations, public spaces to engage with these issues and talk to people um, about their different kinds of views so that it's not just information coming through um, fake news media, as some people call it. Um, and I just wanted to mention, oh, I'm going to, mention, I'm going to show you two extremes of mobilities research that I'm involved in. So one is, this is the project that I'm working on with colleagues at Aalborg University in Denmark. It's called Airport City Futures. And it's the first major Danish research project exploring air travel, airports, and airport cities from the integrative and interdisciplinary socio-technical field of aeromobilities research giving special attention to the super users of the airport, the business travelers. And it looks at management planning and design aspects as well as individual behaviors that influence travel experiences. So part of mobility's research looks at the, um, what I call the kinetic elite, the hypermobile, the super air travelers and distant business travelers. Um, 
And so sometimes designers and architects are working on designing that to be more, even more business friendly, um, which is interesting, but hopefully also bringing a critical perspective to it. At the complete opposite end of the kind of work I do is this event called Red May, which I'll be going to in Seattle in the weekend of May 18th, 19th. Um, and Red May is organized by Verso Books and it involves left-wing uh, intellectuals, artists, and organizers having a series of salons and meetings across the city of Seattle. And they say, maybe we can't move beyond capitalism by next week, but we can sure as hell take a vacation from it. Um, and you know, if, if everything around us chants, there's no alternative to capitalism, if all we're told is that history is over and it ends with us, don't you think simple mental hygiene demands that we try to think outside of that box for, at the very least, one month a year? So join us for a month's vacation, a left-wing arts fest, a one-month teach-in, a multi-venue, hydra-headed, no apologies jam. We want Seattle to turn red for a month. So I will be doing um, a kind of book talk uh, on mobility justice at the, I think it's called the Northwest uh, Cinema, or I'm, it's like an independent film house. So I'll be in a movie theater talking about a book and then doing um, a, a, a conversation that's done in the style of a town hall meeting where three of us um, are, are going to meet, including one of the other speakers is um, Cedric Robinson. Uh, is it Robinson or Johnson? Um, who wrote the book Neoliberal Deluge about um, post-Hurricane Katrina New Orleans. And so we're going to do this town hall where we kind of put proposals on the table, debate them, and then have the audience vote on them. So that should be really fun and interesting. Um, and so um, if there's time, I have a couple of websites I could show briefly, or we can go to questions. Yeah, OK. So thank you, and I'd love to hear your questions about any of this work. Um, uh, wonderful talk and uh, fascinating work, maybe. Thank you. Um, so I, I have, there's a lot of things I'm thinking about that we can talk later. But um, uh, the question that I have, well, uh, what I want to say is that like, when I, I moved here you know, from, from California, and, uh, and one evening, my first time on the regional rail, uh, going to Mount Airy, I think, uh, I was like, why is it skipping all this space? Um, and then I went to the event, and I thought, well, everyone's on the tr the rail is like mostly white, uh, which I was like, oh, curious. And then I did the thing in Mount Airy, and I ended up coming back on the bus that goes down Germantown, and then I noticed the bus is like 99% black. And then I thought, oh my God, stop this racist. <laughs> um, uh, and so, <laughs> and, and um, and of course, living in large cities in the United States, you know, there's some moment when you come to that realization, if you, uh, 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 you know, are thinking. Um, and so I'm just wondering, like, more about how you are involved in, or like, in your work, does it connect with, like, uh, or you can say more about how it connects to like cities and sort of big transportation things like that. Yeah, okay, I can't fix SEPTA, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's a big ask, but I would love to fix SEPTA. But um, so yeah, so our, our regional geography came about through racist institutions. The suburbanization of Philadelphia involved white flight from the city. The deindustrialization of Philadelphia left behind jobless neighborhoods. And the public transportation system has been underfunded, but also has been divided, as you say, between a sort of stigmatized bus system and then the regional rail, which serves suburban commuters. And weirdly, there is like a stop in um, North Philadelphia that it is no longer operational, right? It goes right past there. Um, but more importantly is the automobility system, right, which led to 
the fact that the neighborhoods outside of the city and the suburbs had all the wealth concentrated in them, despite the fact that the people worked in Philadelphia and were benefiting from the city, and all their property taxes stay outside the city. And that led to our underfunded school system, and the underfunded school system led to more segregation, et cetera, et cetera. It's all connected. So one thing I'm really interested in is how mobility connects to land use and segregation. And, and for me, we can't fix Philadelphia's like transport problems unless we also deal with the land use issues, right? Affordable housing, tax bases, how do we fund the school system? Um, why should Lower Marion School District have the highest spending per pupil compared to the city, which has the lowest, you know? And then those things, if those things are fixed and people redistributed themselves differently, then we would have a more equitable transport system also. But it would help if SEPTA had more funding, too. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Uh, you mentioned you mentioned working in West Philly and getting some grants with neighborhood groups and with neighbors. And I wonder if you could talk more about the the nuts and bolts of that, but also how did you how do you think about the ethics of your own mobility, like as an academic, going in and out of the academic sort of life with this yeah. kind of hybrid work? So yeah, that's a great question. And so we were doing, when we were doing these projects in 2011 to 2013, it was before the Dornsife Center existed and um, really instrumental in even making any of the connections between Drexel and the community of Mantua possible was um, James Wright. And I don't know if you know James Wright who was the uh, working at the People's Emergency Center. Um, he really, has been for years, um, along with the gentleman I showed, George Stevens, really working with people in the community and small businesses in the community. And th they were interested in what was going on with Drexel and like Drexel, why uh, they didn't, they had a lot of issues around Drexel's expansion into the neighborhood just for student housing, but people not actually frequenting neighborhood businesses or talking to people. And so the Dornsife Center kind of arose out of an effort by Drexel to try to be more part of the neighborhood and more connected with the neighborhood. So I, I don't, like I haven't been involved in that whole expansion and development and the many community-based courses that are, are now happening. Um, and, and you know, Cindy Rickards who's very involved in Drexel's programming um, around the civic engagement courses and so on, community-based learning is much more knowledgeable about like what's happening now. So we were just like a first experimental tendril trying to like see what happens if our students try to actually talk to people in the community and meet them. But with that said, it was awkward and problematic and there's power inequalities involved. There's issues of racial, um, uh, what would you call it, um, awkwardness of our white students walking around the neighborhood and our black students not being comfortable walking around the neighborhood with white students and white teachers. And we're all, we were all aware of that and trying to like work through that with all the difficulties it involved. When we brought in some of the artists to work with the class, um, one we had was um, Jawale, Joe, Jawale Joe Waller, I believe is her last name, who's an organizer, a choreographer who did the, uh, was part of the group called the Urban Bush Women. And she had extensive experience of working through dance and choreography with students and with communities. And so she kind of helped do a creative process with the class to sort of deal with some of those issues. But it's not a like an one-off thing and it's really a long lasting process. And one of the issues in any kind of work like that is not having students just show up and leave. And how can Drexel build sort of continuity in any kinds of programs it might do? Thank you so
so much for the great uh, talk. I think one of the things that I think we're probably all struck by is how varied uh, the audiences are that you're able to engage with. And uh, many of those different audiences have kind of different languages, so to speak. I'm putting air quotes for the people on uh, online. Who can't speak. Languages. And then, you know, even when we're speaking the same language, we're often using different technical terms. And I would love to hear um, kind of more broadly about how you overcome, you know, communication barriers across different, you know, groups, whether that's the people you're collaborating with or communicating to, um, both specifically, but also kind of in a broader sense. Yeah, that's a great question because. And coming in a, first of all, in an interdisciplinary academic setting, we need to be able to talk between scholars in humanities and social scientists and artists um, who all are speaking different ways, right? And even the anthropologists and the sociologists and the geographers all have different theoretical baggage and ways of talking about stuff. So I think initially as academics, we were kind of trying to work out those conversations. And then as it broadened, also we were working internationally with colleagues who spoke French and Danish and German and Spanish and now it's spread to Asia and um, Latin America and um, Nigeria. And so we were, you know, kind of working across academic field differences, linguistic differences, and of course the differences of academic communities that work in different languages. Um, so there was all that happening. And actually it turned out that artists are a great way to help that communication happen because they like put a thing in front of you and like you all like are like, oh, look at this thing and like <laughs> let's do something with it. And so you, that like thing becomes the mediator of the conversations. Um, one of the art projects we did was called Drift and it involves these um, kites, the solar kites that when they heat up in the sun, they float up into the air. And so like this whole conference, like we all went out on the English grassy lawn and we were like flying these solar kites and um, all like ooing and aahing like little kids. And so like stuff like that, it's that kind of embodied physical and emotional engagement with issues. And that's also what the choreographers do who work with classes is they get you out of your head kind of and into a more embodied interaction and that can help I think different kinds of people coming from different backgrounds speak to one another. And it's sort of one of the concepts behind mobility's research is this idea of a mobile ontology, but I won't go into all that, and like the relationality and assemblages and different kinds of theoretical concepts. Yes? Have you tried to... Have you tried to involve STEM students in any of this? Ah, okay. So STEM students, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Yeah. Yes, we have. So we, the artist I worked with uh, in, in teaching, whose name was Hannah Iverson, we applied for um, seed funding from the Excite Center here at Drexel for a project called Sonic City. And it, uh, Sonic City involved s engineers um, and technology folks um, along with artists and mobility researchers to kind of figure out um, the design of a system that would play different kinds of music as you moved around Philadelphia. And we were imagining this um, archive of location-based Philadelphia bands, artists, I mean, it has such a rich musical tradition in the city, and what if, if you were at the bus stop or just driving by on the bus at that location, you could hear the music that's associated with that location? It was like a simple idea, but it involved buses and bus stops and networks and antennas, and we kind of came up with a scheme with it, but we never, got, we never implemented it. But that would be the kind of thing we would be interested in. Certainly many of the um, sonic uh, art pieces, there, there are many sonic art pieces and sonic walks, mm -hmm. and they involve this kind of interface between technology and a certain degrees of engineering sometimes, um, along with like sound, sounds. So maybe I'm going to uh, take the liberty to ask the last question because I know we're, we're rushed. We'll have time for folks to still continue. Let you have to read it. Um, 
in our field. Have you given any thought to the power and the, the injustice and, and the balance of accessibility, mobility in various parts of life when you're talking about reaching information? In particular now with data and all the different changes and how people, the haves and have nots, being able to get access to um, information, to truth, to not. Um, any thoughts to start looking in that area and how that affects mobility possibilities? Yeah, um, so I would say I haven't thought of it myself in terms of um, libraries and sort of archives, but more broadly speaking, I've been, um, there's a lot of work happening in the field around uh, mobile communication technologies and how people can access information in like most of the world where people's internet access is through their phone. And there's many, many creative people, groups, organizations that are working on kind of grassroots information technology projects using cell phones around the world. And so we kind of, uh, our field connects with some of that work. And um, in particular, I uh, did a project with Patrick, who's over here, Patrick Gorian, on post-earthquake Haiti. And I was very, became very aware of the fact that the researchers and the first responders and the foreign people there had internet access through their phones and um, satellite communication technologies and that a lot of Haitians didn't, even though they had phones. They didn't necessarily have the kind of access to that information technology um, that had high you know, data usage rates, et cetera. So um, I'm interested in how emergency response uh, technology is being developed that actually is accessible to people experiencing the emergency rather than just to the responders. And even when the power goes out. Yes. <laughs> but anyway, thank you so very much. So let's thank her once again. Thank you. Thanks. So let me invite you to still have